Well, today I'm returning to an author whose work I seem to come back to on quite a regular basis, Mr. Christopher Maxim, and I have got some fantastic news for you all. Yes, indeed, he is giving away a free book of his stories, How to Exit Your Body and Other Strange Tales. This is absolutely free to you. What? What? Did I really hear that right? Yes, you did. Totally free to you until the 27th of May. Just look in the video description for the link that will take you to your free book. All you need to do is write an honest review on Amazon in exchange. Now, my dear friends, two short stories for you this evening. The first one, previously unrecorded, and the second one, a fantastic story from the book in question. Now, sit back and relax with your favorite drink, my dear, dear friends, because it's time to listen. There was once a small business in New England by the name of Grove Wood & Co. It existed for roughly seven months, from April 27th to November 22nd in the year 1913. At least, that's true for one timeline. I'll touch more on that later. Masquerading as a capeside souvenir shop, most of Grove Wood & Co.'s customers were oblivious to the store's true nature. Only the rich elite were granted access to their secret arsenal of products. You see... During the brief period of time that they were operational, the company collected, tinkered with, branded, and sold various objects, each one of which had otherworldly properties, giving their owner a unique power, supernatural in nature. How they acquired such artifacts, no one knows. On November 22nd, 1913, in its original timeline, the building vanished without a trace. Not only from sight, but from the memory of everyone who had ever interacted with it. Like it never existed in the first place. It seems the building and its inhabitants fell victim to an object malfunction. More specifically, a temporal hiccup caused by a time travel device as it was being sold. The origin of the anomaly is more than likely a defense mechanism of the device itself. It would appear that some of these objects are sentient to some extent and can flee when they detect a nearby threat. Uh, that's all I'm at liberty to say about this particular event. So, where did Grovewood & Co. unwillingly relocate to? Well, that's a loaded question. The building, it seems, is constantly jumping from place to place, year to year, and timeline to timeline. It's a bitch to drag down, but with a little luck and a great deal of skill. I'm able to do my job just fine. What is my job, you ask? Well, I am responsible for keeping the building and its objects from destroying the multiverse as we know it. <laughs> you know, the usual 9 to 5 bullshit. In all honesty, I'm a lowly office peon where I'm from. There are people getting paid a hell of a lot more than I am, doing much more important work. <laughs> all I do is tap into the multiversal time grid, and post messages in timelines where the building is likely to show up, in the hopes that some might believe me and heed my words of wisdom, should they need them. But don't worry. There are greater precautionary measures in place. This is just a small, added measure of protection. Okay, note. The building has been spotted in 432 locations. Exactly 26 timelines were discovered to be worthy candidates for the next jump. Twenty-five of those are now considered safe. Your world is number twenty-six. Now, without further ado, here is my warning. Yes, some of it has been copied and pasted, I admit. Hello, I am here to warn you. Your timeline has been deemed a likely landing zone for Grovewood & Co. Though we can't pinpoint the precise date or location of the impending dispatch... We can tell you what to look out for and how to avoid total annihilation at the hands of an object. The building will take the place of another building in your town. You won't remember the previous building, and you'll know Grovewood & Co. as if it has always been there, as will its workers. Upon entering, you might feel that something's not quite right. Though it exists in your memories... Part of your brain may fight the narrative and make it feel increasingly unfamiliar. If you're lucky, you may even recall this post and some of its details. We can only hope. 
If you're able to gather your wits and swim against the current of your fabricated memories, then congratulations. You were stronger willed than most, but this is no time to celebrate. The sudden appearance of Grovewood and Co. deems your timeline vulnerable, more vulnerable than it has ever been before. It's up to you, the only person wise to the charade, to fix things, well, if only temporarily. It's imperative that you relay this phrase, verbatim, to the shopkeeper. Might you be so kind as to direct me to your written wares? I'm in the market for a parable or two. Yes, this is your ticket to the good stuff. The shopkeeper will bring you to a room housing nothing but a bookcase, filled with books published by the Morai Initiative, another entity we are working to locate behind which is a set of stairs that lead to the building's second floor. Once upstairs, you will find many objects. A mirror that can trap souls, a picture frame that can show you still images of the afterlife, and even a crystal ball that gives anyone who touches it the power of clairvoyance. None of them are worth your attention, save for one. In the back left corner of the room, hanging next to some jewellery, you'll find a golden pocket watch. This is arguably the most powerful item in the shop, though most of its powers remain dormant until the anomaly took place. An object's power can change when used in conjunction with another object. This is the object you need to get to. Remember what I said about sentience. Some of the objects will cause trouble if they sense danger. Walk around the room a few times, act casual, when you finally do grab the pocket watch, show no signs of excitement or nervousness. On the front of the pocket watch is a large ampersand. On either side of it are GW and CO, respectively, denoting the shop's branding. Clicking the button atop the watch will open its face and reveal to you a single dial and a circle of letters, A to Z. These letters are key to your world's survival. The pocket watch works like a combination lock. Spinning the button will move the dial to letters of your choosing. It's very important that you enter the following sequence. Right, O. Left, V. Right, A. Left, I. Right, L. Left. Though the pocket watch isn't the device that caused the temporal disturbance, that one is still missing in action, it does have similar properties. Entering this code will reactivate the anomaly and jump start transport. Greenwood and Co. will jump to the next timeline, and you will more than likely have no memory of the events that transpired. That's it? Really? <laughs> yes, that's it. Moving the building to its next destination is the greatest thing you can do. It allows us more time to perfect our endgame plan, currently in development. The multiverse is at its safest in between jumps. The longer the building sits in a timeline, the greater the chance there is of something messing with a pocket watch or another object in the shop, and creating a chain of events that inevitably leads to the destruction of all that we know. Having said that, keep this in mind. If your finger slips, or you fail to recall the combination properly, you are endangering everything. One wrong letter, one wrong turn of the watch's dial, and all layers of physical reality and consciousness might intersect, creating a cataclysm that may very well end all of existence. Sending you in is a danger in and of itself, but doing nothing is far worse. Until the problem can be resolved, this message is one of many small hopes that we have. With any luck, we will find a better solution. Until then, the safety of the multiverse is in your hands. Don't fuck it up. I was just a kid. I didn't know any better. Oh, even if I could go back, what could I have done differently? Could I have changed what happened? 
Could I have done anything at all? Probably not. Even so, I can't seem to help but dwell on the details. Some nights it keeps me from sleeping. Well, I can only hope that sharing my tale will help ease the burden. I don't remember much of my childhood before my mother passed away. I was told she was struck by a car on her way to work. I was only four years old. Still, I know that I loved her. Part of me still does. It's a strange, lingering feeling that doesn't go away. As much as I loved her, I feel that my father loved her even more. I say this because my mother's death took an immense toll on him. Up until I was about ten years old, he would have a nervous breakdown, tears and all, at least once a month. He never told me why, but I know it was because of her. Things changed a bit my tenth year. We moved out of that house, the one that reminded us of her. My dad pulled me out of the school system, and we moved into a cabin out in the middle of nowhere. It might seem a bit drastic, but it was clear that my father needed a change. He wasn't doing so well. Because of this, I didn't question his actions. From that point on, we lived a simple life. My dad took odd jobs here and there. And seeing as we lived up north, selling firewood was sufficient enough to supplement the rest of our income. That was my job. I would go out each morning with my dad's old axe and chop up some logs for our eager customers. It wasn't much for life, but it was good enough. Comfortable with our new living situation, I was taken completely off guard one night when I heard the sound of crying coming from my father's room. We'd been doing so well, so why was he still in such dire straits? Before I could analyse the situation any further, I heard my dad get up and slam the door shut on his way out of the cabin. I was compelled to follow him. Peeking out of the cabin's entrance, I saw my dad storm off into the woods, bringing with him an acoustic guitar. I'd seen the guitar before and I knew my dad used to play, but I'd never seen him handle the thing. I'd figured those years were left behind him. Curious as to what he was up to, I followed him into the forest. I tiptoed, making sure to hide behind trees and avoid stepping on leaves as I went. Eventually, we came to a small clearing where I noticed a creek. Near the creek was a stump where my dad sat down and adjusted himself until he was comfortable. He looked down at his guitar, closed his eyes, and began playing. I stood in awe of what I was hearing. A haunting, melodic mixture of my dad's voice and the rustling of trees in the wind filled the forest. I knew he played, but I never knew he could sing. It was amazing, for lack of a better word. This went on as often as my dad had breakdowns in our previous house. Each night it happened, I would follow my dad out to the woods and listen to the beautiful song he'd seemingly written. I didn't really know what it all meant, but I could tell, even at age ten, that it stemmed from a place of great pain. I could tell that somber, heartfelt tune was about losing a loved one. Whenever I tried to picture my mother, the image was always blurry and out of focus. Almost as if what little memory I had of her was slipping away. Whenever my dad played his song, I could picture her as clear as day. <laughs> it was the oddest thing. This brought me comfort, and ultimately helped me come to terms with her death. I'd hoped, at the time, that it was doing the same for him. Being ten years old, though, it was hard to tell what was going through an adult's mind. Many months passed. The routine was nice for a while, but one night, everything changed. I heard the usual swing of the cabin door followed by a swift crack against the doorframe. It was very loud, signaling to me that my father was more distressed than usual. I hastily made my way to the door in an effort to follow him, but I stopped for a moment when passing his bedroom. The door was just open enough for me to see the guitar leaning up against his bed. How peculiar. I wondered why he'd left it behind. In truth, there was only one way to find out. My dad was already at the creek when I arrived. 
He sat on the stump, motionless and quiet. He was in a sulking position, and his eyes were closed. Without his guitar or voice, the forest around him was void of sound. The only thing I could hear was the water in the creek as it trickled by us. Soon enough, my father began singing. I could tell it was the same song he'd always sung, but it sounded off. Without his guitar, his voice was muddy and out of tune. There were some awkward highs and lows that actually made my stomach turn. Though his eyes were still shut, I saw tears force their way out and watched as they swam down his cheeks. Eventually, he stopped singing and broke down crying. What happened in the following moments will stay with me forever. As my father wept, something strange happened. A milky white fog danced across the water. At first, I thought my eyes were playing tricks on me. But eventually the white smoke gathered above the creek and took shape before my very eyes. It was a spirit. No ordinary spirit, mind you. No. It was my mother. My father stopped crying and instead began shivering. He opened his eyes and looked up to see the spectre. He almost fell backwards in fear. The ghost of my mother reached out and began choking my father. His face went from red to blue before my mum stopped. He fell to the ground and vigorously gasped for air. I couldn't bring myself to lend a helping hand. I was stuck in a petrified state. My father tried to crawl away, but it was no use. My mother began clawing away at him. She tore through his clothes and eventually his skin. I watched in horror as she reached into his body and ripped out vital organs. His bones snapped like branches. His blood tainted the water. His voice once again filled the forest. Only now it was screams of agony. I couldn't bear to watch any longer. So I shut my eyes. With my eyes closed, I remembered the song my dad sang. I started humming it to myself, and, just like that, I calmed down. The world around me became quiet. All I could think about was the song. Memories of my parents came through the floodgates as I hummed. Tears rolled down my cheeks. I couldn't help but fall apart. What had my childhood become? Where was I to go from there? Eventually, I stopped humming and opened my eyes. The apparition of my mother was gone. My dad's open corpse lay on the stump where he used to sing. As the scene before me sunk in, so did my heart. It crawled into the pit of my stomach and made a nest. It would stay there for many years to come. I don't really remember running back to the cabin. Nor do I recall calling the local authorities. What I do remember is the look on their faces when they took me back out there and saw what I had seen. The sight of my father's body was a grisly one, that's for sure. It was unlike anything the town had ever seen. Still, it was taken care of in a swift and respectful fashion. In the coming months, the investigation came to an end. Cause of death was never determined, but that doesn't mean there were no answers found. My mother's body was discovered buried beneath the creek. My father's axe was determined to be the murder weapon. One of the theories floating around the town was that my dad was the jealous type. They think he convinced himself my mum was having an affair and then lost his marbles. Feeling guilty, he moved us out near the dump site so we could be closer to her. I guess we'll never know the full story, but one thing is for certain. My mum had her revenge.
Well, 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 what do you think of those two? Fantastic stories, eh? Well, you know what to do now. Click on the link in the description, get your free book. And if it's after the 27th of May, well, go to Amazon and order it from there. A real bargain, I can tell you. Okay, that's it for me for tonight. You all sleep well and have sweet dreams, and I'll be back again with another treat for you on Friday. Until then, bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay? <laughs>